Hey, Bass family. This last Wednesday, September 30th, uh, Rocco Prescia, the legendary bass player from Tower of Power, passed away. And it just sent uh, shocks through the entire world. And um, I'm sure that the Prescia family and the band um, and anyone who knew him closely appreciated everyone showing uh, love and support. And... Um, that's what we're doing. We're going to forego the regular question and answer period of the Bass Family Chat. And today I literally just asked everyone to share their thoughts on Rocco and his life, his music, what Rocco meant to them. And uh, I'm going to start with a quick story. Uh, so, you know, I, I grew up in Northern California. And once I started working, I was 18, I started working at Music Pro. And um, the owner of the company, Hal Race and Mike Salkowski, uh, Gary Dunsmer, everyone there that worked there, were huge Tower of Power fans, and they would play uh, songs and talk about it quite a bit. And of course, that just bled into me finding out uh, who they were and just being stunned by the entire band, but of course by Rocco's playing. So fast forward, as a uh, student of Musicians Institute, uh, Musicians Institute in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, had a great relationship with Tower of Power. It seemed like um, the band would play there every year, and Rocco would sometimes come in and do like little open counseling sessions. And um, so I got to see the band live uh, as a student of mine. And then once I became the, the head bass counselor there uh, and had my own office, some wonderful things started happening. And that's Rocco would come to show up to do these own counselings. And the first time I ever had a one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussion with him, I was in my office and I heard a knock on the door. I said, come in. He opened up and there's Rocco. And I'm like, hey, Rocco. And he's like in that wonderful gravelly voice of him. He's like, hey, uh, uh, they said that maybe you had a guitar cable I could borrow. I'm like, absolutely. So I reached in my gig bag, gave, gladly gave him my guitar cable. He's like, hey, at the end of the day, I'll bring it back to you. I was like, no problem. No, no problem. And um, I didn't see him. Through, you know, the, I wasn't able to go and check out his open counselings, and um, he didn't stop back by. So I'm like, you know, no worries. And then several months later, because he, he didn't come... I think probably once a year, if I remember correctly. But then, like, he would next time he would come by, uh, he'd be a knock on my door, and he'd be like, "Hey, man, how's it going?" I'm like, "Hey, great." And he's like, "Hey, you have a guitar cable I can borrow?" I'm like, "Absolutely." And I would reach in and give him a guitar cable, and he would go, and I wouldn't see him again. And uh, after the third time it happened, um, I was chatting with one of the bass instructors who knew Rocco, and uh, uh, like much closer than me. And I told him the story, and he's like, "Oh, man, do you want me to say something? You want me to try to get some cables back to him?" I'm like, "Good Lord, no." I can't ever repay what Rocco's done for me musically. I can't repay the, the hours and hours and hours of joy. No, if it, I will give him a cable every time he comes and not expect it back, nor want it back. You know, although it would be interesting to play that cable after he's played it, see if maybe I'm funkier. Can't be that easy. Rocco, I'm gonna miss you, buddy. I gotta see you many times at NAMM shows afterwards. I gotta see you live in Arizona. Uh, I, I, just, I'm going to miss you, buddy. And, uh, and I'm, thank you. Thank you. You are immortal because every time I listen to your music, you live again. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Ryan Medora here. And uh, I wanted to share with you a Rocco story. So um, the story that I have is actually kind of a Rocco slash David Garibaldi story. Um, when I was uh, teaching at a music camp in the Philly area, probably about I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, um, I had a group of kids and the, the goal was to have all the kids in the band. I was the bass player and the band leader and we got to choose songs and learn how to play them and then we went into a studio and then uh, recorded the songs and did a live show at the end of the week. So within one week the kids got to find some music they wanted to play. We all learned how to play it and everything like that. So uh, the first day of the week I come in and the group of kids that I have were just great. They were really into like funk music and soul music. They're like, yeah, like we just want to play like cool stuff. And I was like, perfect. Um, and the drummer said that his drum teacher had just taught him about David Garibaldi and he comes in with a book and says like, oh, I have this like book of grooves and I'm trying to play it. And I was like, great. And uh, these kids are like 13, 14 years old. Meanwhile, I said, well, not only do you need to know who David Garibaldi is, you need to know who Rocco is. Um, and the other kids in the band, like the, there were two guitar players and a singer and uh, some horn players, they had never heard of Tower of Power. And so we had a listening session where we just learned the catalog. You know, we listened to so many great Tower of Power songs and my um, 
true joy in life was getting to introduce these kids to Tower Power and the rhythm section of Rock of Stea and David Garibaldi. Um, and the kids loved it so much that we actually uh, included one of their tunes in the set. We did a fun intro of Squib Cakes into uh, Soul Man. So that was a pretty fun thing. And uh, that's my Rocco story. You know, I never got to meet him in person, but um, I really enjoyed getting to share Tower of Power's music with a group of kids to kind of, you know, bring the next generation of funky, groovy listeners into the world of Tower of Power. So, uh, again, like he's a huge influence of mine, a phenomenal player, someone who will be uh, very much missed. And um, I am just grateful that I've been able to learn from his music and to be able to spread the love. So, all right, take care. So we lost the amazing Rocco Prestia this week. Phenomenal, groundbreaking, trailblazing the whole bit, right? So when I first moved to LA in about 1985 or four, you ask around about where to go hear some great music. There was a club in the San Fernando Valley on Ventura Boulevard called Josefina's and people recommended I go there. And so I did, and I walked into the club one night and got about five steps in, and my breath was practically knocked out of my body by the bass playing. And my first thought was, boy, I hope this is someone famous because if this is just some local bass player, I should probably leave town right now. And of course it turned out to be Rocco Prestia playing in a club band. And of course, just carrying the band on his shoulders like he did in Tower of Power to some degree. So uh, the great, phenomenal Rocco Prestia. Uh, I will miss everybody, I assume, all the bass players at least will miss. And so, uh, yeah, that's my Rocco story. He knocked me over one night, unbeknownst to me, uh, he was playing in a club in the San Fernando Valley. <laughs> the great Rocco Prestia. How's it going? Luis Espayat from Nashville here. Hope all you fine folks are doing well. It's amazing that uh, here we are again having to say goodbye to yet another legend in the music world, in this case, Francis Rocco Prestia of Tower of Power. How I first became aware of Rocco was right when I started Berkeley with my private instructor, Anthony Vitti there. Um, Anthony had asked me, what do you want to work on? Um, what do you want to get out of this? And I told him, I said, well, I want to continue to work on my chops and my facility with the instrument. But man, I just want to keep working on my groove and pocket and just, you know, the thing that just makes people want to dance. And uh, he said, I know what you need. Here's what you need. You need some uh, Rocco Prestia and some Tower of Power. So one of the first things he gave me was this transcription, which I have to this day of uh, Bum City there by Tower of Power, which showcases one of Rocco's amazing bass lines. And let's face it, all of his bass lines are amazing, um, but man, Anthony couldn't have been more right as far as combining those chops facility, those amazing 16th notes that Rock can do, but the way he can pocket them there, him and Gabe, Dave Garibaldi, what an amazing rhythm section. So, you know, over the years I got to work on Bump City and What Is Hip and what else do I have here? Squib Cakes and I've got a few of them. I got a stack here, but uh, man, just, uh, what an amazing player, and not only just that amazing right-hand technique of getting those 16th notes to, 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 to real steady and real pocketed, but also his left hand just able to put the right amount of mute to get that sound and get it to, to bubble just the right way. So uh, still working on that to this day, uh, but man, what an amazing time and um, to be at Berkeley and start to learn the stuff and really open up my eyes and my ears and my mind to the stuff. Um, I unfortunately never got to see Tower of Power with him in the bass slot. I regret that greatly. And I've never got to meet the man or see him in person. So I know a lot of people told me some great stories about doing just that, but unfortunately I never got the opportunity. So, um, man, he'll be, uh, greatly missed and, uh, but his music lives on and his amazing bass lines. And apparently I still got a lot of studying to do. So take care y'all. See you soon. Remembering Rocco, um, I saw Tower of Power uh, for the first time when I was, I think, 14. And um, I had been to rock shows before that, but it was my first um, non-rock and roll concert. And uh, 
at the time I was very interested in David Garibaldi and Rocco and the rhythm section connection uh, that exists, one of the greatest rhythm sections in my opinion of all time. And uh, how they function together is absolutely amazing. But I just remember that was the day that I learned that the rhythm section and the bass player made people dance. And I just saw people's reaction, because at rock concerts, people are acting crazy. They're doing all kinds of, of crazy things. But at this particular uh, night, when Tower of Power was playing, David Garibaldi and Rocco were locking in, uh, mind you, playing a lot of notes and playing them very well as well. Um, but people wanted to get up and dance. And it was absolutely amazing. Uh, I was blown away, and that's the day that I learned that it was my job for the rest of my life uh, to make people dance, and the smiles that they had on their faces, and just, just having a good time. Uh, absolutely. It was, it was wonderful. Rocco had a smile on his face. He was grooving super hard. Rest in peace, Rocco. Hello. Uh, this is a very very sad thing to have to do. It was never my privilege to get to meet Rocco in person, but uh, I'm a, uh, always a big fan of anyone who takes a stand to develop their own way of playing. And um, in interviews with David Garibaldi, uh, he spoke very highly of Rocco's determination to play with his fingers rather than conform to the slap style that was becoming increasingly popular. Uh, David described his and Rocco's uh, collaboration as the other side of the coin to John Entwistle and Keith Moon, whereas uh, David is highly educated and, and schooled in understanding uh, music in a very, very detailed and complex way, Rocco played instinctually and had a fantastic um, internal understanding for music and what a song needed and just went there. He, he I know that he learned more, as we all do and progress, but he... he knew to go with his gut in creating a part and playing uh, any song. The finger style funk uh, lesson with uh, Rocco that he did, which was a, uh, a VHS uh, purchasable you know, teaching instrument, it was never converted to DVD. So I, I've been unable to uh, find the copy of that. But, um, I, I found it on YouTube, and so through the grapevine of a couple of mutual acquaintances and, and friends, I passed on the message to Rocco that when I saw him, I owed him 20 bucks, because I'll be working on that. Uh, his, his method, his, his approach to playing, I'll be working on that the rest of my life. Though I'm very sad that he's gone and that we didn't have an opportunity to meet one another and and um, and that would have been such a joy, uh, I'm grateful that he has left behind a legacy that will affect every single person who will pick up a bass. Uh, there, no one will ever repeat what he did and um, but we'll all have to learn from it and, and work uh, work with what he taught us in his play it, whatever happens I know that he will never be forgotten um, and everyone who did have the privilege of meeting him in person and getting to know him one on one um, I know that his health was quite poor for some time and um, so treasure the memories that you have and uh, honor the legacy that he's leaving behind. 
thank you very much for allowing us this opportunity to mourn uh, with our community. Hey, Everything Base. Hope everybody's doing good out there. Marie's coming at you again. Hey, yeah, since the last time we uh, we saw each other, we uh, lost a, uh, a base great, the awesome Rocco Prestia, Francis Rocco Prestia. Man, um, no words can say what that guy contributed to this uh, to this instrument and its uh, funkiness. But uh, yeah, actually, um, since I grew up playing a lot of rock, uh, Tower of Power came into my life kind of late. I um, I have to credit the uh, teachers I've had, and especially Musicians Institute, and um, an instructor over there named Alexis Sklareski that introduced, or not introduced, I had, I had known of them, but I had not dug into that band um, until I got to the school. And... Um, yeah, we studied him in our technique class, and wow, that rapid, that rapid fire right hand sixteenth note thing with the ghost notes and the and the and just the steady funk lines. Wow, what an amazing what an amazing player, and what a um, you know a solid voice that he laid down for himself. The um, the teacher I just spoke of, he uh, he brought him into the school a couple times because he uh, they were friends and and. Uh, Alexis had produced a uh, instructional video that Rocco had out, which was very popular, and we got to meet him a couple times, and that was just amazing. But um, yeah, I'm always at a little bit of a loss for words when these things happen. It's it's a mark of time, and and uh, Rocco was such a uh, you know such a pillar to this to this uh, low frequency thing we do, and uh, yeah, gonna be missed. I uh, I wish all the best to his loved ones, and uh, and to all of us that appreciated him so much. You know. We are lucky to have lived in a time when he uh, did his thing, and uh, and uh, we can't be thankful enough for that. So let's uh, keep him in our heart, and let's keep grooving to his uh, to his lines, and, and and passing it on to other students. All right, the great Rocco, we're gonna miss you. Everything base, we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye. Well, this is a tough one. Um, Rocco was such an influence on me, and all virtually all of us in the bass world. Uh, of course, like everybody, I've seen him a lot of times over the years. I saw Tower in 1976 at the Texas Electric Ballroom, and they were incredible. And uh, later on, saw them a couple of times in Nashville. One memorable evening was at the Ace of Clubs, a defunct club in Nashville, and they were touring for the Monster on the Leash album, and it was just incredible, the funkiest thing ever. And then um, the last time, our um, we were out on tour with Engelbert, and we went to um, see them do their, their thing. I think it was maybe at the MGM Grand. It might have been in another place. might have been at New York, New York. But our sax player, Mitch Riley, was friends with Rocco because he... Worked in L.A. with the Tower Rhythm section, so we got the VIP treatment then and got to hang with the guys after the show. And, of course, like everybody, I saw Rocco at a lot of different uh, trade shows and, you know, around. And he was just part of the bass world and the bass community and definitely an icon. So this is a tough one. It's a hard thing to replace. You can't replace anybody but somebody who is a groundbreaking player who changed the way a lot of people play and think about the bass and about funk. You know, he just took what guys like Bernard Odom and uh, Jerry Jamott and the, and the guys that were the precursors and just ran into town with it. And we all, everybody who plays funk finger style owes a huge debt of gratitude to uh, Rocco and rest well, sir. You made a difference. Hey everybody, it's Mark Corradetti and I've been asked to share, um, you know, my, uh, thoughts about Rocco Prestia's passing this past week. Um, well, he was a huge influence for me. I just loved the way he, uh, um, approached music in general and just, just, just the groove, you know, um, with uh, all the songs, you know, What Is Hip and Oakland Stroke and all of it. And I had a chance to meet Rocco once at a NAMM show with a chance meeting. You know, you go out into the uh, 
back alleys and there he was just uh, you know smoking a cigarette and having a cup of coffee and uh, I had a chance to just just hang with him you know we didn't really talk about much but he was just this really sweet guy you know and uh, you know you think about all the uh, um, all the records that they made and you think about all the uh, um, you know touring that they did that's a lot of bus time um, you know and he had some real rough rough times here in the last uh, 20 years with his liver and all that kind of stuff and he was just a uh, a, a real working guy um, amazing bass player with an amazing talent I don't even think he could uh, read music um, too much or anything but uh, um, man just he'd love doing it his way and boy did he ever he really influenced uh, uh, me on the way I think about time and groove and you know playing with the drummer and you know gosh I listen to his records all the time and um, I love Tower of Power and um, yeah, I, I, as far as I know, that's really the only band he ever worked with, since he was like 14 or something like that. But uh, what a what a what a talent! So we really had a, a nice time uh, um, talking to him. Um, just he was just a regular guy, real the, the real gruff voice, and I I just you know I was just uh, very impressed. I I just thought he was thought he was the greatest even back when I was uh, a lot younger um, you know guys would say hey man you gotta check out uh, Tower of Power and you know the, the, the just the bass players and this guy named Rocco and it was just uh, fantastic and uh, you know fortunately for us his music will live on through his recordings and and things and uh, um, you know we, we really lost a good one um, a great one um, you know one, one of the best um, a true master and a true uh, um, uh, just everything. He he was fantastic, um, a, re a real original. That's what I meant to say. So uh, best to his uh, family and um, um, you know maybe he's a, we could learn something from him. We can listen to his records and you know just try to remember how that made us feel. Um, yeah, you know, it, it was a horrible, horrible time, but, uh, you know, uh, he was certainly a nice guy, and uh, he was a, certainly a wonderful, wonderful musician, and added a lot to uh, the sound of Tower of Power. I, I really, really enjoyed him. Hey, Dale, thanks again for giving us bass players a uh, platform um, to speak about all things bass-related today. I know we're talking about... Um, Rocco Prescia and, and sharing our memories of him. And uh, some of the things that, that come to mind right off the bat, well, one of the main things is that, you know, when we think about like the heroes of bass, there are people, the superstars, the, the Jockos and Marcus and Victor, um, that people who even aren't, even people who aren't bass players know. But then there are guys like Rocco who have really, uh, put a, a significant dent, a mark on music, not just bass playing, but music in general. Um, you know, Rocco is, is one of those guys, you know, as you know, I have, uh, I grew up here in New Orleans, but then I also grew up in the Bay Area as well. Uh, lived in New Orleans until I was about 24, grew up, went to school, and then went out to the Bay Area. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a distinct difference between like the funk of the Bay Area and the funk of New Orleans. You know, maybe it has something to do with the heat. You know, down here the funk has got sort of a lilt to it and uh, uh, a saunter to it. Out in the Bay, you know, the Tower of Power type funk is um, a little bit more rigid. And I don't want to say rigid like it's a bad thing, but you know, those those staccato 16th notes, the you know, those crispy horn lines, um, the precision of it. Is just, you know, beyond. Um, I played with Ronnie Beck, uh, drummer who played with Tower of Power for, for a little while. And so I had to learn a few of those bass lines. Never played any of them well. I don't think I did any of them any justice. But, um, you know, getting inside that stuff, you know, getting inside those bass lines, you could strip everything away. You could strip the 
the, the horns away. You could even take out the drums and you would still hear the song. That to me is the mark of a, a great bass player, a great bass line. Um, and so I didn't really know Rocco. I got a, a, a couple of opportunities to, to interact with him. Always a sweetheart of a guy with that raspy voice. Um, you know, it's, it's always sad. It's never not sad when someone passes away, someone who has influenced your life. Um, and, you know, the, the culture of a group that you find yourself in, like bass players. But it's also... Um, uh, a feeling of peace and joy um, for them when they're able to finally take their rest and have have and have left a legacy behind in the way that Rocco did. I know he had health problems for many many years, and so um, he will be missed definitely. Um, but we're I'm glad. I know you guys are glad that those bass lines are still here. That music is still here, and um, it it really. It, it's really a, a, a wonderful thing to have have lived in the same era as uh, a great player like Rocco Prestia and to have had to get inside some of those bass lines. Um, you know, they're uh, they're like every one of them is like an is like an etude. You could take a bar of what is hip and and just and totally transform your. Uh, you're muting and you're alternating on your plucking hand. It's incredible stuff. So again, Dale, thanks for this platform. Uh, thanks to all the other bass players that contribute. And I will see y'all next time. Peace.